So today I want to talk to you about the Christian identity. Who are we in Christ? And I want to present to you the biblical answer to the question, are Christians still sinners or are they saints? Or is there somewhere in between? Are they kind of both? Um, first, I want to start off with this verse, 1 John 4.17, Herein is our, our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. And so, have any of you uh, ever heard or said any of the following? We are all sinners. We are still sinners. We all sin. Or, I am just a sinner saved by grace. Or the only difference between us and the world is that we are forgiven sinners. Among many evangelical Christians, there is a strong conviction found in the oft-expressed phrase, We are all sinners. The truth of the matter is, we are all sinners. From a little baby all the way up till we die, we are our sinners. The context of the message, we are all sinners, implies that the only difference between believers and non-believers in regard to sin is that believers have been forgiven and have the assurance of an eternity in heaven. Our identity, if we relate to this message, is that we are sinners who have been saved, but basically sinners. This tradition is especially strong among traditional evangelical denominations. Are we as Christians the same people we were when we were non-Christians? Are we made new? If we are made new, how new? What is left of the old? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And passed away is past tense. And are become is present perfect tense. Do not misunderstand. There can be no denial by any Christian that sin still exists in the life of believers, regardless of maturity or calling. Because 1 John 1.10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The confusion comes from not clearly defining the words sinner and saint, and from not teaching believers the whole counsel of God about who we are now in Christ. The Bible reveals two distinct meanings for the word sinner. The first describes a man who is a slave to sin and separated from the life and covenant of God in Christ. He is a sinner by nature and a sinner by his actions. The second simply describes a man whose thoughts, words, and actions are momentarily contrary to the life and covenant of God in Christ, whether he is a believer or not. However, we are confused by the fact that not all who meet the second definition meet the first. Someone whose thoughts, words, and actions are sometimes contrary to the life and covenant of God in Christ may not be separated from the life and covenant of God. But, uh, but the one who is separated from the life and covenant of God in Christ is a sinner by both definitions. Thinking of ourselves as being forgiven sinners but still essentially sinners, causes us to experience confusion when we are also addressed as saints. And when we read passages that tell us we are now the, confu we are now the righteousness of God in Christ, that we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another by our identification with who we are now in Christ, and that we are now participants in the divine nature, we assume that this is a kind of title that has no practical application until we are resurrected. Are sinners also saints? Are sinners also the righteousness of God in Christ? Can sinners be transformed from one degree of glory to another? Can sinners participate in the divine nature? Consider the following verses. James chapter 3 verses 11 and 12 doth a fountain send forth at the same t at the same place sweet water and bitter can the fig tree my brethren bear olive berries either a vine figs so can no fountain build, can, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh in Matthew 7:18 Jesus said a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit and in Matthew 12:33 Matthew 12.33, he said, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. 
And so this may not be specifically, you know, answering this, are Christians saints or sinners, but it, we get this black and white distinction, okay? Uh, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, and a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Can a fountain at the same time bring forth sweet, or, or sweet water and bitter? You know, so there's these clear distinctions. Can a person be a believer and an unbeliever? A Christian and a non-Christian are saved and lost? So, I have said earlier that uh, a problem with this is that the word sinner, the word saint, is, is not really uh, often defined. So, we've already talked a little bit about what a sinner is. That, you know, there's two different senses we can use it. But I want to look at who is a sinner according to the Bible. And I want to look at verses. We're going to look at a lot of verses, and some of this might be a little bit redundant. Going over the same topics, the same mentioning the same thing. But we're just going to kind of do a little bit of a word study. And I would suggest that you do this on your own, too. Just look up sinner, look up saint, and see if you see some of the same things. Every time the word sinner is used in the Bible, it is used of an unregenerate person. Let's go, to, or let's go to Genesis chapter 13, verses 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So when we see sinners, we can think of the men of Sodom. They were sinners. They were wicked. They were wicked sinners. In Psalm 1, 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Okay, so we have sinners here paralleled with ungodly and with, with scornful. And blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of, sin, in, of sinners, or standeth in the way of sinners. Okay, Psalm 1.5, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So we see these distinctions here, the congregation of the righteous and sinners, the counsel of the ungodly. Two completely separate different spectrums there. Um, a sinner is a synonym for the wicked, which is contrasted with the assembly of the righteous. And so Proverbs 11.31, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Okay, the wicked and the sinner are one idea. The wicked sinner. It's a figure of speech called hendiatus. And so sinners are wicked. There is no such thing as a wicked Christian. Okay. Ecclesiastes 9.2 All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not, as is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth, as he that feareth an oath. So what we see here is as different as the righteous and the wicked or the righteous and sinners are, they all have the same fate. Okay, But we're still seeing this huge difference that's being contrasted here like black and white. Isaiah chapter 1, 27 and 28. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. The destruction of the transgressors and the sinners. Sinners will be destroyed. Consumed. Does that sound like Christians? Does that sound like someone who's saved? Amos 9, verses 8 through 10. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, I will command that I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Doesn't sound very good for the sinners. Matthew 9, 13. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Sacrifice, For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sinners need salvation. Sinners need to repent to be saved. 
Matthew 26, verse 45, Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. The disciples are not sinners, because he came to his disciples and said unto them, that I am betrayed into the hands of sinners. That's what he said. Luke 6, 23 through, or 32 through 34, For if ye love them which love you, what thank, have, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good, do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Christ is telling his disciples not to live like sinners. Luke 15, verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. After you are converted, you are no longer a sinner. Luke 15, verse 10, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Angels will rejoice when a sinner repents because the sinner has been granted salvation. Christians don't need to repent for salvation. They are already saved. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? In Jude, verse 15, To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The ungodly and the sinner are not two separate groups of people. Again, this is a hendiatus, meaning two for one. The ungodly and the sinner together are expressing one idea. Ungodly sinners. Sinners are ungodly. Is there a such thing as an ungodly Christian? Are Christians ungodly? Absolutely not. So, 1 Titus or 1 Timothy, sorry. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murder, murderers of mothers and manslayers. In 1 Timothy 1, 9, ungodly and sinner are compared with even more lawless, disobedient, unholy, profane, murderers of fathers, and mothers and manslayers, qualities of a Christian, God forbid. The sinner and the ungodly shall be damned to hell, except they repent. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved into fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So, um... We see here from all these verses that I went over, hopefully, I hope you get this, that you know, a sinner is always an unregenerate person. It's always contrasted with you know, the righteous. Um, we are not to live as sinners, as Christians. And so there are some commonly misunderstood verses, like 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. But Paul was not saying that as a Christian currently, he was chief of sinners. If Paul was stating that he was a sinner currently, then he would still be in need of salvation because he just stated that Christ came to save sinners. Paul was simply acknowledging that before he was saved, he was a wicked sinner, even guilty of persecuting the church, restating what he already stated in two verses prior in 1 Timothy 1.13 when he was speaking of himself, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And so, also, uh, some under misunderstood verses as far as sinners. We got James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh unto God, and he will dry, draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. 
And I think that this is a call for salvation in, in the assembly for those who who have professed Christ but not truly uh, gave their heart to Christ. They haven't truly been converted. So we see that it seems to be often in James and some other epistles where there are all these, these calls to salvation in the epistles. Now I've seen someone else said that this could be a rebuke to people in that assembly. Um, you know, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. But either way, if this is a, a, a call for salvation, some kind of evangelism, or if this is a rebuke, it's it's not in a good light. Okay, it's not like you know, like brothers, we all are sinners. We all need to cleanse our hands, and you know what I mean. This is a, some strong language here. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So. Again, that does not, that's not saying that saved people are sinners, okay? Um, or that we are all sinners. We don't get that from that. James 5, 19 and 20, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which cover, converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Again, a lot of people get mixed up on context and stuff and say, oh, this is written to save people and this says brethren and everything, so it has to be a saved person. And, you know, uh, so, so this could be talking about a Christian being a sinner. No. Um, save a soul from death. Hide a multitude of sins. We're talking about a person who still needs salvation here. They erred from the truth. They fell away from the faith. They fell away from a profession of Christ. This is speaking of people within the assembly who were never saved. They fell from the faith. They forsook the assembly, but go after them, try to bring them to Christ, and then convert them for real. Okay, so this is not an, a verse that you can use to say that, well, here uh, Christians are being spoken of as sinners. No, it's saying a person who professes Christ, uh, they fall away from the faith, and one of, of the brethren converts them back, uh, you know, or converts them for real for, for this time. Uh, they will save a soul from death, spiritual death. Okay. If you are a sinner, you are headed for death. A sinner is someone who is sinning a lot. Okay. Um, as I researched the New Testament, I could not find a single instance where believers as a body were addressed as sinners, as they are today from many pulpits. They were always addressed either as saints or as brothers. Even in the case of the Corinthian man who committed fornication, Paul did not refer to the man as a sinner. Instead, he gave the church instructions on how to bring the man to brokenness so that Satan could not outwit them. So what does it mean when God calls His children saints? In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. Who are the saints that Paul is speaking of? Is it those super-Christians who have now died, those holier-than-thou folks? who we make statues of and stick little ones of on a dashboard and put their pictures on necklaces and kiss them before a big game or before we go up to bat. Those saints, the saints we canonize and elevate to near God status so that we expect them to evoke God's favor on our behalf, the Christopher, Mother Teresa type who are now dead. Those are the saints according to the Roman Catholic Church. According to the Roman Catholic Church, to be a saint, you have to live a saintly life. You have to be super pious in your service, be a nun or a priest. You have to, be, you have to have performed two miracles, two confirmed miracles, and you have to be dead. Okay, so that's a saint according to the Roman Catholic Church. That's a whole different video, a whole different teaching on itself. Um, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're going to talk about saints according to the, the King James Bible. And according to the King James Bible, every believer is a saint as a result of experiencing the redemptive work of Christ, not as a result of some prior act of courage, sacrifice, or theological brilliance, or so-called miracle. In the King James Bible, the word saint is used 66 times and is used to translate two Hebrew words. The root idea of the first Hebrew word that is used uh, in the word saint in English is 
So the first idea, okay, is separation. In a religious sense, it means that which is separated or dedicated unto God and therefore removed from secular use. The word is applies, applied to people, places, and things as the temple, vessels, garments, the city of Jerusalem, priests, etc. The root of the second word is personal holiness. With a collective noun, the reason or personal holiness, the emphasis is on character. It has a strong ethical connotation. These words are used either in the plural or with a collective noun. The reason for this is that a person standing before God is regarded as a matter of his belonging to the larger whole, the nation of Israel or the Christian church. This larger whole standing in covenant relationship to God. Uh, in the Septuagint... Uh, hmm... I don't even know why I put that in there. Who cares what the Septuagint says? Anyways, in the New Testament, this word is transferred to the members of the Christian church. The saints are the church. 1 Corinthians 1-2 The church comprises people called out of the world by God's grace to be His own people. All who are in covenant relationship with Him through the repentance and faith in His Son are regarded as saints. Objectively, saints are God's own holiness throughout the Bible, but especially in the epistles of the New Testament, the saints are urged to live lives befitting of their position. Ephesians 1, 4.1 and Colossians 1.10 So... 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Note that this is the church of Corinth, called to be saints, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to run through a little bit quick, quicker some um, things that we learned from verses about saints. In Psalm 16.3, uh, the saints are God's delight. In Daniel 7.18, the saints possess God's kingdom forever. Romans 8.27, the Spirit intercedes for saints. In 1 Corinthians 6.2, saints will judge the world. In 1 Corinthians 16.1, they took collections for the saints. In 2 Corinthians 9, 1 and 12, we minister to the saints. In Ephesians 1, 15, we show love for the saints. In Ephesians 3, 18, Paul said he was the least of the saints. In Ephesians 4, 12, um, the pastor or teacher equips the saints. In Ephesians 6, 18, we pray for the saints. In Colossians 1, 12, we receive uh, the, the saints receive an inheritance. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 The saints will return with the Lord Jesus. In Philippians, Paul prays for all the saints in, one, in Philippians 1.4. He loves all the saints in Philippians 1.7. He yearns for all the saints in Philippians 1.8. He hopes to continue with them all in Philippians 1.25. And he greets all in, or says to greet all in Philippians 4.21. So I said, said that there's two different uh, you know, aspects to the word saint. And so I'm going to go over those just a little bit more. So the first is our holy position in Christ. The word saint means set apart or consecrated for the purpose of God's service. So this is our position in Christ. Saint does not mean that one is sinless, but is also not describing a defiant sinner. When you are saved by Jesus Christ, He takes all of your sin, past, present, and future, on Himself. He gives you His, righteous, his righteousness, meaning that now you are in His position, perfectly holy, and can now enter into His presence because you have been covered in His righteousness. You are wearing His righteousness. You have the right clothes to be in heaven because of what Christ has done. You are set apart, set apart from sin to holiness, set apart from Satan to God, consecrated exclusively for Christ alone, for His fellowship, for His service, and for His blessing. You now belong exclusively to Jesus Christ. He bought you. You are His. You have been bought to service Him alone. And so also from the word saint, we get our holy lifestyle practice. In Ephesians 5, 3 through 5, but, no, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as become as saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 
If you are a saint, then your behavior, your practice will be different. Everything you do now is not for you, it is for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.15 And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. In Philippians 2, 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. So, we, we, I went through the Bible and seen what is a sinner? It's always an unregenerate person. What is a saint? It's someone who is set apart for the service of Christ. Someone who lives holy. Okay, All born-again Christians are saints. But we must understand that Christians... Saints do sin. Only our Lord Jesus Christ was without sin. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Only Christ was without sin. 1 John 1, 8-10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sin, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. If Corinthians don't, or Christians don't sin, then what is the purpose of progressive sanctification? And why did Jesus tell us in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6.12 to ask God to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So, Christians do sin, and that's a whole another separate study on itself as well, uh, about you know refuting sinless perfection and all that. A lot of false teachings concerning that. Saints do sin. And, um, let's see... There are some different ways, though, we can go about it. Um, Christian sinning. You know, there is a perspective to where we don't have a defiled conscience. In 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul said, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. So Paul's saying that he had a clear conscience. He didn't know of any transgressions, you know, that he felt guilty of at that current time. So we can have a, you know, at times we can have a defiled conscience or not have a defiled conscience. You know, we can go a day without having a defiled conscience. You know, we can maybe go a week without going having a defiled conscience. Um, but Christians do sin. Um, so I'll have to go to that, go into that more in another study, but I think that we have uh, confirmed that Christians do sin. And so the next question is, how can God call us saints when we still commit sins? The problem here is that we assume saint means sinless perfection, but it does not. A saint is someone who has been sanctified or set apart for the purposes of God through regeneration. Therefore, being a saint includes residual sin, but it also includes the ability to overcome sin by grace through faith. In a practical sense, born-again believers are still sinners. Well, people can say that because they can say, well, sinning is a verb or something, you know. So if a person commits a sin, that makes them a sinner. But I was thinking that doesn't always work even in the English language and stuff. Like, let's say that I ran today, I ran around the block, and I told somebody that I ran today. Does that make me a runner? Um, you know, if I haven't ran since high school... <laughs> uh, because I ran around the block today, does that make me a runner? Because we think of a runner as somebody who you know goes runs a lot. They're athletic, you know. That's their that's their thing. They like to run. So I think that's the same way we look at sinners too. Uh, a sinner is an unregenerate person. They they're totally in defiant sin, constant rebellion against the Lord. Okay, it's 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 more than just you know committing it, the act. But you know people can argue that that technically you know. If a, when a Christian commits a sin, that makes them a sinner at that moment or whatever, you know. But uh, that's not what we never get that from the Bible. Um, so I'm going to continue here. We experienced a profound change at the moment of saving faith that separated us instantly from who we are or from who we were before that unique moment. It should be intuitive to believers that this change was not merely external in the form of forgiveness. 
and a future inheritance, but internal as well. And it grieves me as it grieves the Spirit when those who should know better continue to teach that we are all sinners. And that the only difference between born-again believers and the unsaved is that believers have been forgiven and are assured of an eternity in heaven. I grant that this may not be the intent of all who use the phrase, we are all sinners. But because it is not taught accurately or completely, believers continue to be confused by the paradox of believing that their condition as a sinner remains unchanged, although their imputed status in Christ is that of righteousness and of being a saint. This is a little like being the Queen of England, but having no power to rule. The title is nice, but is purely symbolic and figurative. We believers also have a nice t little title as being the righteousness of God in Christ and of being saints. But according to some, while we are in the body, we are still essentially sinners by nature. The title is purely symbolic and promissory with no actual experience of true righteousness or holiness available to us in this life. The problem in teaching that we are all sinners, both by action and nature, is that this error hinders the beautiful truth of 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we who have been born again have experienced a profound change, a change that literally empowers us by grace through faith to walk in true holiness and righteousness even while in the body. There are various models put forth for the makeup of a man, but without arguing the merits or choosing the model that I use, the spirit is the part of man capable of sensing and relating to the spiritual dimension. The body is that part of man capable of sensing and relating to the natural world and the soul, mind, emotions, will is that part of man capable of processing both and choosing a response to either. The biblical terms, the heart, is frequently a reference to both spirit and soul, innermost being. And it is the heart or soul as dynamically influenced by the spirit, a living soul, that determines whether a man is a sinner or a saint. The Bible says that God created Adam as a living soul capable of uninhibited communion with both God and with the natural world. When we talk about the way in which Adam was created, we say he was a generated or created being. Generated, created being. As a generated man, Adam's spirit was alive to God, and he communed freely with the Father. Adam's soul, his mind, emotions, and will were not sinful because his living soul was in perfect agreement with his God-connected spirit. Likewise, his physical body was not sinful and was not subject to death or decay. Thus, Adam's essential nature as a generated man was one of innocence without spot or blemish because his spirit was alive to God and his soul was, as yet, untarnished. When Adam broke the covenant with his spirit, when Adam broke the covenant, his spirit was disconnected from God, became dead to God, and he became a degenerated man, no longer capable of complete, uninhibited communion with the Father. Adam's soul and body, too, now disconnected from the influence of a God-connected spirit, became corrupt and subject to sin and disobedience, death. Thus, Adam's essential nature as a degenerated man was sinful because his spirit was disconnected from God. And all men and women born since that time have been born in Adam as degenerated beings with spirits disconnected from God and corrupt souls and bodies enslaved to sin and disobedience, death. It is God's purpose through Jesus Christ to reconcile men to himself in order to fulfill his original purpose and plan for mankind. This reconciliation begins with the regeneration of man's spirit and his instantaneous sanctification or setting apart for the purpose of God, followed by a gradual transformation of his soul and the ultimate resurrection of his body. It might be helpful for those who are confused by the use of the word sinner to think in more abstract terms. A man is either degenerated in Adam and a slave to sin, or he is regenerated in Christ and now has the ability by grace through faith to overcome sin. Romans 8, 1 and 2, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, to walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Upon faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, our spirits are made alive to God again, and we are said to be regenerated. However, the new connection in God to, to God in Christ does not automatically transform the soul, mind, emotions, will, or the physical body. Therefore, the born-again believer is subject to both the old, degenerated, sin 
untrained aspects of his soul and the new regenerated aspect of his spirit. But the reconnection to God and his spirit has brought about an essential change. He was degenerated and a sinner, or a slave to sin. He has now been regenerated as a new creation. The workmanship of Christ created in Christ Jesus to do good works and the righteousness of God in Christ. The old has gone at the cross and the new has come in resurrection life. And because his spirit has been made alive to God, he is now a saint. It's interesting too when you're talking about a slave to sin. You know, Jesus said that he who commits sin is a slave to sin. <laughs> he didn't say he who commits sin is a Christian or he who commits sin is a saint. He said, he who commits sin is a slave to sin, a sinner. And we're talking about continual, defiant lifestyle of sin. 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And 1 Corinthians 6.11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. In the preceding passage, we should note that the believers have been washed, forgiven, and cleansed of sin, guilt, sanctified, set apart for the purpose of God, and justified, given right standing with God. At the moment of our mystical and corporation, in Christ by grace through faith no one who has been forgiven and cleansed of sin guilt set apart for the purpose of God and given right standing with God through the blood of Jesus Christ should deny or denigrate the finished work of Jesus Christ by continuing to refer to himself or to believers in general as sinners yes we all continue to sin to some degree but we are not sinners we are saints who sometimes sin, and the term sinner should only be used carefully in reference to the saint who is caught up in some specific habitual unrepentant sin. We confess unbelief and error by referring to ourselves with the title of sinner. That title implies that we have not been freed from the power of sin in our lives and therefore denies the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. There is a great divide between the biblical teaching that we are now the righteousness of God in Christ who still have sin in our lives because, we are unre because of our unrenewed minds and residual influence of the as yet untransformed flesh, the old man, and those who preach and teach knowingly or unknowingly that we are still sinners by nature. Sinners who by the grace of God and our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior are going to heaven but still essentially sinners. A great divide between those two teachings. And one is biblical and one is not. One of the key passages for our understanding of this paradox is found in 2 Corinthians 4-7 as Paul points out that we have this treasure, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in earthen vessels. This reference to our physical bodies, this is a reference to our physical bodies and to the non-transformed aspects of a believer's soul as earthen vessels does not infer the status of a sinner. A sinner does not have this treasure at all. A saint has this treasure in a non-transformed physical body and in completely transformed soul in order to reveal the glory of Christ manifesting itself in the life of the regenerated saint that's from God and not from the believer himself. But the life and glory of Christ is never revealed in the life of unregenerated sinners who have not experienced a new birth and do not have this treasure. One of the reasons we have a problem accepting what Scripture says about who we are in Christ is that we base our judgment on the common non-Christian worldview that a man's essential nature is defined by his behavior, appearance, accomplishments, and status in society. The biblical truth as defined by Scripture is that a man's essential nature is defined by his spirit or his heart, that innermost part of his being that is either connected or not connected to God and not by external appearances or behavior. Sanctification, the process from which we get the word saint, means to be set apart for the purpose of God. It does not mean sinless perfection. But God does not ordinarily set apart sinners for His purpose either. Upon our faith in Jesus Christ, He changed us through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Who We who were sinners became saints. Okay. Uh, let's see.
The natural, unregenerated man does not have the influence of Jesus Christ in his spirit. His spirit is not dead, but it is no longer connected to God. In the degenerated state, man is still capable of spiritual communion, but he no longer has a direct connection with God. Therefore, his thoughts, words, and actions are influenced entirely by the way his natural intelligence, potentially influenced by, his, by spiritual communion with demonic spirits, responds to the social and spiritual environment of the world's systems that he comes in contact with. Scripture teaches us that these world systems, religion and spiritual activities, government, economy, media, education, science, etc., are primarily influenced and controlled by Satan, the god of this present age. It is natural, then, for the degenerated man's thoughts, words, and actions to be a result of his attempts to meet the natural, self-actualized, psychological needs of security, identity, stimulation, and even spiritual fulfillment through those same world systems. The result is, by definition, sinful, no matter how good he may seem to the world, because that man who is a sinner, by God's definition, cannot by any means produce the righteous nature of Jesus Christ in his thoughts, words, or actions. The scriptural biblical world view is that a man's status is determined entirely by whether he is still a degenerated being with no connection to God or a regenerated born-again being who has a direct connection with God through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The one who has been regenerated is thus dynamically connected to the divine nature and included in the covenant of God through Jesus Christ. If a man is degenerated, he is a sinner. If a man has been regenerated, he is a saint. No amount of sin in the believer's life matters in regard to this definition. A man is essentially either a degenerated sinner or a regenerated saint, period. Just as the genetics or DNA of a plant or an animal determine the essential quality of that plant or animal, the regenerated man's spirit is made alive to God when God's seed or spiritual DNA, which is the quality and character of Jesus Christ himself, is planted in our spirits in the form of the indwelling spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The inductive question that should come to mind immediately upon reading this passage is, Can a sinner also be the temple of God? The same question has to be asked concerning all other passages concerning who we are now in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. I frequently hear those who believe to use, those who love to use, sorry, those who love to use the all-inclusive phrase, we are all sinners, also urge others to live right in order to maintain their fellowship with the Lord, but the two are mutually exclusive. If you claim to be a sinner, saved by grace and going to heaven, but still essentially a sinner, then you are incapable of true fellowship with the Lord while still in the flesh. Because Romans 8, 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Thus the regenerated man's essential nature is changed because he now has the spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ in his spirit. He was a degenerated sinner, and he is now a regenerated saint. But his mind, emotions, and will must undergo a progressive transformation from the inside out. This process is called progressive sanctification, or the renewing of the mind. In order for the believer's thoughts, words, and actions to become an expression of his new essential nature as a saint and the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 7 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness does not mean to become perfectly holy. It means to enter into the process of becoming mature in the holiness already imparted to us through the new birth as we conform to the image or spiritual DNA of the Son in our spirits. And Paul says that we should do this with fear and trembling. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have already have you as as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more with my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Obviously, Paul is not talking about salvation. In terms of regeneration here, he is talking about the process of transformation 
that takes place in the life of a born-again believer as he makes obedient faith responses to the revealed will, will of God. This process of progressive sanctification or perfecting holiness is also commonly referred to as Christian growth. But it is not automatic. It can be resisted by the believer, but the Word of God warns us that we should take the process very seriously as we respond positively to the transforming influence of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 3, verses 4 through 6, Whoever, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knoweth known him. First John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. John is not saying that the believer will ever walk in sinless perfection. He is saying that it is no longer his essential nature to sin. A dancer may fall down, but falling down is not a part of being a dancer. It is the dancer's nature to dance, not to fall down. A crippled man falls down because it is his nature to fall down. And he is incapable of dancing. Okay. So, John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a Christian? No. It's a servant of sin. The sinner is a descriptive term. It's a style of life. You sin. A sinner sins because it is his nature. Cannot produce righteousness, the nature of Christ. No matter how moral and good he is, a regenerated born-again believer is righteous by nature through the indwelling presence of Christ. And even though he may fall down in his thoughts, words, and actions, when through disobedience he rejects the revealed will and indwelling influence of Christ in his spirit. The born-again believer, though, is capable of grace-empowered true righteousness and holy living when his thoughts, words, and actions are in agreement with the indwelling presence of the Lord when he is abiding in the Lord. Um, therefore, the believer, when the believer sins, he is like a dancer falling down. He is not like a crippled man who falls down because it is his nature to fall down. Likewise, those who are still sinners can never reveal the glory of God through their obedient faith responses to the revealed will of God, but those who have the Spirit of Christ in their inner being are capable of experiencing the glory of God, who is Jesus Christ, and of being transformed in our souls by that experience so that His glory is manifested in our thoughts, words, and actions. Okay. Um... It is not incorrect to refer to a believer who through a hardened heart deliberately keeps on sinning as a sinner because we are referring to his deliberate, habitual, disobedient behavior, not his essential nature. However, we are not all sinners, even as a general description of our behavior. There is sin in every believer's life, but the presence of sin is not what defines us. We are defined by the presence of Christ in our spirits. When John says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning, he is not making a direct reference to the law of the spirit of life, but he is revealing the principle. Living in him, in Christ, is the same as walking in the spirit, walking by faith, um, walking in the light, etc. It is, engraft, it is the engrafted life of the believer, living vitally connected to the vine by grace through faith, and in that believer the law of the spirit of life overcomes the law of sin and death. But if the believer becomes disconnected uh, or broken fellowship, the law of sin and death dominates again. If I think like a sinner, speak like a sinner, and act like a sinner, am I not a sinner? A sinner may adequately describe your behavior at the moment, but you are not a sinner if you are born again. You're like a bad dancer who continually falls down. You're like a caterpillar struggling in the, in the uh, chrysalis to metamorphose into a butterfly. The caterpillar is really a butterfly that has not yet manifested its true nature. The butterfly nature is buried deep in the double helix of its DNA, and regenerated believers likewise uh, have the spiritual DNA of Christ in our spirits, working its way out through the trials and struggles in this life as we learn to obey the Holy Spirit re revealed will, will of God in our lives. Some butterflies, though, never make it out of the cocoon. They are butterflies, even in the larval stage, but they never manifest the fullness. Uh, 
Okay, I don't totally agree with all that. I don't know why. <laughs> that. Uh, anyways, some. Am I coming real? You know, we mankind are not all brothers any more than we are all sinners. Those who are in Adam are brothers to each other, and they are sinners by nature. But those who are in Christ are no longer brothers to those who are in Adam. We have been adopted into the family of God, and our brothers are those who have likewise been adopted into the family of God. Neither are we all sinners. We may still look and act like sinners, but because the spiritual DNA of Jesus Christ himself now indwells our spirits, the manifestation of our new Christ-like nature should be taking shape more and more as each day goes by. So, <laughs> hope that answers that question. Uh, you know, are we in Christ saints or sinners? We are saints, even though we still continue to sin. It's because we are defined by our essential, our new nature, okay? We are defined by our new nature. And so now I want to talk about where does this concept come from that we're all sinners, we're still sinners, or you know, just sinners saved by grace or whatnot. Okay, a lot of it comes from the, the growth of the modern church system. So I'm kind of like hitting two birds with one stone here because I want to do plenty of studies on the modern church system, why that's corrupt, and people should just stay away from buildings called churches because that just puts people in bondage. There's so much false teaching and stuff in there. But because of the growth of the modern church system, and there's a couple different, maybe a few different aspects within that. One is that in this modern church system, in these buildings called churches, there is an emphasis on evangelizing the lost by bringing them in instead of going to them. You know, Jesus said, go out. Go out and make disciples, right? Go out and preach the gospel. He didn't say, go out and preach the gospel of the church to get people to come into the church, and then you preach the true gospel to them there, whatever. That's, that's not the order that we should do it. You know, the Bible does say that unbelievers might walk by the assembly, and, you know, I think when it's talking about speaking in tongues, and, you know, if there's no interpreter, then how can they understand it? And so, you know, it's, if, if, if unbelievers come within the assembly, you don't, you don't have to completely, you know, reject them. And you could evangelize it to them, but the, the, the main way of evangelizing is to go out, not to bring them in, okay? And that's different if they happen to walk by than, than trying to get them to come in, okay? So there's an emphasis on evangelizing to the lost by bringing them in instead of going to them. And this is why it is taught that we are all sinners, because part of the reason why so many Christians are willing to believe that they are still sinners is that evangelicals continually preach that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is accurate when related to the unsaved and to the believer's former state of being. But this sin consciousness pervades and perverts what Scripture says about our new life in Christ. The lines are blurred, and our awareness that there is still sin in the life of believers binds us to the beautiful truth of God's Word. In some of the churches, the churches that I belong to, at the time of my conversion, I wondered why the Sunday morning sermon was always an evangelical message preached to the same believers who had heard the same message over and over. I learned that evangelism was the strong point of that denomination and that the preaching of an evangelical message each Sunday morning, along with the overextended invitation or altar call, was traditional. So the altar call is a big part of this, you know. Um, at the end of every Sunday, you know, it was always, well, you know, if you're lost today or whatever, uh, you know, raise your hand or look at me and we'll say the sinner's prayer and we'll have the whole congregation say the sinner's prayer. You know, Lord, I'm a sinner. So, you know, everybody, even people who are saved in the congregation, we're saying we're sinners. We're going through the whole thing. And, you know, that's not biblical. <laughs> that's false. And, you know, that, that causes harm, and we're going to see about that, too. What are the effects of this teaching? You know, I've already kind of went over some of that, but now we're going about where does this come from? So it comes from these false church systems, from these altar calls, from trying to bring in the lost to evangelize them, which really what they're trying to do is to get them into the church, to be a part of the church, to tithe, to help in the building, to help in the programs, to make the pastor, the pastor quote-unquote, more rich, to get money. It's a business scam. It's a scheme. It's entertainment. It's false. It's ridiculous. It's wicked as hell. So, it's no wonder why so many believers in these denominations still identify themselves as sinners and cannot identify with their new life in Christ as saints because they are addressed as sinners every Sunday morning from the pulpit. 
and also what goes on in this modern church system, if not that, there is also a lot of compromise, which hopefully you don't get a lot of that from me because I'm not uh, you know, trying to get ties from anybody or anything. I don't care if people don't watch my videos or listen to my teachings. I don't care if I get hundreds of thousands of dislikes and everybody unsubscribes from me. I could really care less. I'm going to study to learn the truth, and if I feel like I've learned the truth, then I'm going to share the truth with you. So you shouldn't get a lot of compromise here. Of course, it's something that we all struggle with, you know, being a hypocrite or compromising, you know. But, uh, you know, the, these church buildings, they just got outright compromise, you know. They just got, they, you know, like Rick Warren, you know. How can I get you to come to my church, you know? Well, stop preaching the gospel? Okay. <laughs> what? Uh, so anyways, uh, it's also my conviction that many who teach we are all sinners do it because it is politically expedient not to challenge that particular tradition in their denomination or fellowship. And they have to use guilt and the opinion of men to motivate their churches to produce the work and support needed in the local fellowship. Oh, a guilt trip. So... Uh, so even though they might not be focusing on bringing in people and evangelizing them, which most do that, but let's say even if they didn't do that, they might uh, not. They might not want to talk about how you know we're saints and we're not sinners. They might not want to give a teaching like this because it might rock the boat too much and people might leave. Uh, you know, lost people might get upset, and so. Um, also, it's a big thing for everybody, even outside of the, the false church system, you know, it's, it's a false sense of humility. You know, saying that I'm just a sinner or whatever, you know, it might seem to be humble, but it's not. On an individual level, self-degradation, calling ourselves sinners, is also seen to be an act of humility. Among believers who are in bondage to this tradition, but that is a false humility of religious pride. That's what it truly is. True humility is the acknowledgement of what the Scripture says about who we are now in Jesus Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. It's not a self-aggrandizing statement. It is a Christ-aggrandizing statement. And I'm just an old sinner saved by grace is not a statement of true humility. It is a statement of unbelief and denial of the finished work of grace on the cross of Calvary. And a big part of it is just the false teaching. It's just false teaching, period. Uh, easy believism is a big problem. The traditional teaching that we, Christians and non-Christians alike, are all sinners may be accepted without question by some just because it continues to be preached and taught. But most believers are willing to believe that they are still sinners by nature because their lives are dominated by sin. You were born a sinner and you will die a sinner. You might be justified by faith, you might have Christ's imputed righteousness, but you're still a sinner. Some may explain this paradox by teaching that we are saints as an imputed position in Christ, but that our condition, or our real life after rebirth, still continues on as a sinner. They teach that the believer's condition will ultimately be equal to his imputed position in Christ, but not in this lifetime. We are the righteousness of God in Christ becomes their statement in regard to our imputed position in Christ. We are all sinners becomes their statement in regard to our current condition or behavior in Christ. It would be accurate to say we all continue to sin to some degree, but we are all sinners implies that no essential change has taken place in our lives. This viewpoint of imputed righteousness but unchanged nature has a certain appeal to our natural minds, especially as we acknowledge the sin in our own lives, and it would be accurate if the new birth was purely symbolical or only fulfilled upon resurrection or rapture. Our position or standing in Christ is that of righteousness because His nature inhabits our spirits, but our condition, our state of being, may, may or may not be that of righteousness because our souls, mind, emotions, and wills are contained or contain unrenewed, untransformed strongholds of the old sin-trained soul. The view of those who believe that we are still sinners by nature is that the soul continues to remain a completely sinful state of being, 
and that we do not put on the righteousness of Christ until we are completely freed from the sinful nature in heaven. But Scripture teaches us that the soul is gradually transformed from the inside out as we make obedient faith responses to the revealed will of God, and that it is God's purpose for us to put on the new nature the nature of Christ, even while we are living in the flesh. Ephesians 4, 24 says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye may put, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This putting on of the new self is something that happens while we are still in the body. And the result is that the initial, uh, the, the initial essential change that took place in our, experience at the, uh, our spirits at the moment of regeneration gradually becomes a condition or actual state of being in our souls, mind, emotions, will, as we begin to conform to the spiritual DNA of Christ in our spirits through faith and obedience. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Peter states that it is possible to rise above the corruption of the old unrenewed soul and participate in the divine nature and this by grace through faith but I cannot imagine sinners participating in the divine nature of Christ nor is there any reason for us to put on righteousness or perfect holiness if we are not intended to walk in righteousness and holiness of Christ by grace through faith. Philippians 3, 8-11, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings being made comfortable, conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Once the essential change has been made in our spirits, we have become a new creation. The righteousness of God in Christ and the passage above, we see that we enter into the Christalis struggle to bring our souls, mind, emotions, and will into agreement with the change that has already taken place in our spirits. Paul, understanding the process of this progressive sanctification or transformation of our souls through fellowship with the Lord, tells us that our fellowship with the Lord brings His resurrection power to bear on our souls, transforming us from the inside out and from one degree of glory to another. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In this amazing scripture, we see that it is our faith-based identification with and obedience to who we are in Christ that transforms us by the renewing of our minds so that our thoughts, words, and actions become like His thoughts, words, and actions. And I just want to mention really quick that there's a lot of other false doctrines that come out of this saying that we're all sinners and uh, in many different denominations they have different things that will separate. There's Christians that, 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 that sin a lot and then there's something that you have to do to, to, get, to gain more power over sin. You know, just being regenerated isn't enough. Like, you know, Pentecostals, they have the, the, the false baptism of the Holy Spirit doctrine, you know, their, their version of it, where, you know, you, you're a Christian, but you have like a defeated life until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit and you speak in tongues, and then you can uh, get higher above, you know, overcoming sin. But you must have that baptism. You know, it's, it's more than just being saved. Or, or like I said, easy believism. They'll say, well, uh, you know, there are these defeated Christians who, who are sinners and they sin all the time. But we, we, they're still saved. But they'll lose rewards or they'll lose their inheritance. So there's this upper class of Christians and there's this, this sin-defeated Christians. And they, they, they make these... Uh, you know, like there's higher Christians, and and some things you got you got to do different things to to get there. So uh, now, why should we care? Why does this even matter? I've already went over some of the reasons why, but we'll look at this more. The biblical answer to this question will also cause you to think rightly about Jesus Christ and His salvation on your behalf.
Some Christians act as if Christ didn't die for all their sins, so they are constantly crucifying themselves over and over again. They lack the concept of complete and total forgiveness. The teaching that we are all sinners hinders our faith-filled identification with who we are in Christ and therefore hinders our transformation into His likeness and thought, word, and action. Our Christian growth. It hinders our Christian growth. It has been proven that men and women of any age will respond to the circumstances of life on the basis of what they believe and what others confirm about themselves. If they believe they are stupid, regardless of their IQ, they will respond as if they are stupid. If they believe they are winners, they will act like winners. And born-again, regenerated believers inhabited, inhabited by the Holy Spirit who believe that they are sinners by nature will continue to act like sinners, living down to their expectations. There will be guilt and remorse as they confess their besetting sins over and over, but there will be no real power over sin in their lives. They are that wretched man that Paul describes in Romans 7, 14-24, and they have not yet been discovered. Romans 7, 25 through Romans 8, 4. Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of this death? To that question, Paul answers, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 8, he explains, emphasizes in his truths. Or, okay, sorry. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is out, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son, and the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, which is how the law of the Spirit of life frees us from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death has reigned and will continue to reign in those who are in Adam, his descendants, but the law of the spirit of life is operative in the lives of those who have been adopted as sons of God and spiritually engrafted into the second Adam, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 44-46, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam made a quickening spirit, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. A law is a principle of operation within a system. The law of gravity is a principle of operation within a specific physical system. The law of aerodynamic aerodynamic lift is another principle of operation within the same physical system. And it becomes operative when a particular wing shape moves through the air at a certain speed. The law of gravity is then overcome by the law of aerodynamic lift. The law of gravity is not destroyed, it is just made of no effect. The law of sin and death is like the law of gravity. It is there as a constant in the as yet untransformed flesh, but just as the law of aerodynamic lift overcomes the law of gravity and makes it of no effect, so the law of spirit, the spirit of life, overcomes the law of sin and death in those who walk by the spirit and the spirit by faith. Galatians 5.16 This I say then, walk in the Spirit, that ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When we saints are walking in the Spirit by faith, according to Romans 8.4, the righteous requirements of the law, God's revealed will, are being fully met in us by a definition. By definition, a sinner cannot meet the righteous requirements of the law. It is difficult, if not impossible, for the believer who still thinks of himself as a sinner by nature to live by the Spirit. He just can't fly because he doesn't believe he can fly wretched man that he is, but the one who identifies with his new nature in Christ will learn to fly in the Spirit because he believes in his heart what Scripture says about who he is in Christ. And as we have previously stated, he rises to the expectation. At first, the, flight the flights will be short-lived and there will be frequent crashes, but eventually the flights become longer and higher and the crashes less frequent and less damaging. Only a strong faith-based self-image of who we are in Christ will prevent us from yielding to the besetting sins in our lives. 
Why then do so many believers cling to the non-scriptural belief that they are still sinners by nature when the Bible clearly teaches us that we are chosen, justified, forgiven, sanctified, regenerated, born again, new creations, the workmanship of God, and dwelt and sealed by the Holy Spirit, baptized in the mystical body of Christ, a holy nation, priests in the order of Melchizedek, ambassadors of Christ, adopted as sons, who are now the righteousness of God in Christ and covenant with heirs in Jesus Christ himself? Well, we went over that, and uh, one more reason. So, now, so I hope you understood what I just said. There is that you know it, it hinders our Christian growth, and uh, I've experienced that in my life. I'm sure that most of you probably have. But you know, after we're Christians and we sin, we do something you know we think that is really bad, and mm, you know we just. Uh, you know, we just we can just grieve over it for a long time, and just it, it hinders you know our activity too. Like you know, it's just it's just like you know I'm I'm just gonna sleep all day now. I'm just a horrible sinner, and uh, you know so I'm not gonna do any work for the Lord today or whatever. Uh, so you know it also it hinders our evangelism. A uh, survey of those who identify uh, themselves as born again evangelical Christians found that fewer than five percent had ever personally led someone to saving faith in Christ. Why are there so few born-again Christians who are personally making disciples? The religious zeal is there to support other ministries and their preaching of the gospel, but the religious zeal apparently does not carry over into the personal lives of many evangelical believers. Why? Boldness and enthusiasm and a personal witness to the lost does not come from training or from programs. It comes instead from the joy of fellowship with the Lord and those who have a strong self-image as sinners rather than a faith-based, spirit-revealed self-image as the righteousness of God in Christ do not frequently experience the joy of an intimate, grace-empowered, righteousness walk with the Lord. Instead, they are inhibited by the belief that they are still sinners and their witness is motivated by guilt rather than the joy of fellowship with Him. And also, teaching that we are all sinners, whether saved or lost, blurs the distinctions set by Scripture, which we have went over many, but uh, there's a little chart here. And I've printed all these notes off my website. You can go to acceptyoubeconverted.com, go to the study, miscellaneous studies, or miscellaneous topics, and the Christian identity. But Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And this isn't speaking specifically about this topic, but I think it's a practical, it's, a, it's, an, it's applicable, right? Because those who are sinners are in the darkness. Those who are saints are in the light. And if we're teaching that we are all sinners, then... Uh, you know, that implies that, that that distinction is blurred. So sinners are unforgiven by God. Saints are forgiven by God. Sinners are degenerated. Saints are regenerated. Sinners are in Adam. Saints are in Christ. Sinners are debauched. Saints are engrafted. Sinners are born of the seed of Adam. Saints are born of the seed of Christ. Sinners are a fallen creation. Saints are a new creation. Sinners are a stranger to the covenant. Saints are in covenant with God through Jesus Christ. Sinners are the old man. Saints, the new man. Sinner, spirit dead to God. Saint, spirit alive to God. Sinner, no permanent influence from God. Saint, permanent indwelt, permanently indwelt by the spirit. Sinner, subject to or judged by the law. Saint, freed from judgment by the law. Sinner, subject to the law of sin and death. Saint, set free from the law of sin and death. Sinner, not sanctified. Saint, sanctified for God's purpose. Sinner, incapable of good works. Saint, created to do good works of faith. Sinner, not gifted by the Spirit. Saint, gifted by the Spirit. Sinner in darkness. Saint in the light. Sinner incapable of spiritual understanding. Saint capable of spiritual understanding. Sinner participates in the atom, atomic nature. And saints participates in the divine nature of Christ. So you see there's a clear divide there. It's like black and white. And we should not mix those two. God doesn't want to mix those two. We don't see that mixed in the Bible. No reason we should do that. So what can we do about this? Change your focus. 
But don't we continually, don't we need to continually hear about the sin in our lives in order to stop sinning? If Jesus Christ showed up at your door tomorrow morning and spent the next 24 hours with you, would you still have a problem with the sin? You would probably say, of course not. If Jesus was with me, I could resist the temptation to sin. Therefore, if we focus on sin, there will be conviction, but no power to overcome the sin. If instead we focus on Him and on who we are in Him, then the light of our fellowship with Him will expose sin, and the law of the Spirit of life will set us free from the law of sin and death. We do need to clearly understand what Scripture identifies as sin, missing the mark or standard of the covenant requirements, and we need to be obedient to the inner witness and restraint of the Holy Spirit in regard to our thoughts, words, and actions. But there will be two distinct reactions by born-again believers to any preaching and teaching about sin. The one who is still in bondage to his identity as a sinner will naturally gravitate toward legalism because external obedience to religious rules and the expectations of men is all he is capable of doing. If he is zealous in his legalism, he will be attracted to constant preaching about sin. He will be angered and confused by any message about who we are in Christ. The one who identifies with his new life in Christ, on the other hand, will be quick to repent as he responds to the conviction of the Holy Spirit because it is now against his inner nature to sin. I am convinced, then, that if we teach believers to identify with who they are in Christ instead of preaching that we are all sinners, those who hear the message will be empowered to overcome the residual sin in their lives. When a believer who is taught that he is still a sinner commits a sin or falls or fails to walk in the will of God, he may feel guilty because of the constant preaching about sin, but he accepts his sin as being normal. When the believer who has a strong self-image of who he is in Christ sins, he is horrified and repulsed by the sin because it is inconsistent with their life as a new creation in Christ. And they feel lost because their damaged fellowship with the Lord. That one will quickly repent and be cleansed. Uh, the one who identifies by faith with what the Scripture says about who he is in Christ is empowered to overcome sin through the law of the Spirit of life. But the one who identifies himself as a sinner is caught up in an endless cycle of sin and guilt. He knows that he is forgiven, but he does not know practically that he has been freed from the law of sin and death. What a wretched man he is. Who will rescue him from that body of death? And uh, so I just want to go over who we are in Christ Jesus again, run down a list with some verses, not all of them with verses, but uh, let's see. <laughs> this is a long list, so here we go. This is our identity in Christ. If we are saints, then how are we to accurately view ourselves? As equally related to Christ, as one body in Christ, as one immersed in Christ, as one who is away from home, in Philippians 3.20, regenerated by the seed of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1.23, a new creation in Christ Jesus, the old is gone, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5.17, the temple of God because Christ lives in me, 1 Corinthians 3.16, a saint and a faithful believer, blessed with every spiritual blessing, chosen in Christ, holy and without blame, loved by God, adopted by God, the praise of His glory, a trophy of His grace, redeemed by His blood, forgiven, partaker of the riches of His grace, heir of God, sealed with the Spirit, alive in Christ, seated in heavenly places, saved by grace, the workmanship of God in Christ created in Him to do good works of faith. Ephesians 2.10 Heir of the covenant Heir of the covenant, access to the Father, fellow citizen with the saints of God, member of God's household, God's dwelling place, bold access to the throne of God, sealed for redemption, a child of the light, a member of Christ's body, no longer in the flesh, ruled by its nature, but in the Spirit, because the Spirit of God lives in me, Romans 8, 9, no longer a sinner by nature, because I have been sanctified and justified, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, because I have been born again of God, it is no longer my true nature to sin, and when I do sin, it is contrary to my nature and to the presence of Him who lives in me, John 3, 4 through 6 and 9. The law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2. Because the Spirit lives in me, I will not sin as long as I conform to His nature through grace-empowered acts of faith, Galatians 5, 16. As He is, so am I in this world, John 4, 17. So be it. A pre-Christian Jewish rabbi once said, I get up, I walk, I fall down. Meanwhile, I keep dancing. He had the right idea. Though we still sin, we have a new identity. That's a reason for a lot of joy, so keep on dancing.
Quit calling yourself a sinner. Christians take their identity from Christ, not themselves. Adam no longer represents us. So God's word is perfectly consistent in calling us saints even though we sin. Have you noticed how many epistles were written to sinners? None. How many to saints? All of them. And, you know, I think that... Uh, and nor does God seem interested in any balance between sinner and saint. So quit the balancing act, throw yourselves headlong into grace, and wallow in it. You know, I think that, you know, being a sinner is, is a gift. I mean, being a saint. Sorry if I said being a sinner. Totally wrong there. Okay, being a saint is a gift. It is part of the package of salvation, right? Salvation is a free gift. We cannot save ourselves, okay? We must receive the free gift. I'm not denying free will. We must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to receive that free gift. Being a saint is part of that package, okay? We cannot make ourselves saints. And I was thinking, if we continue to call ourselves sinners, and we say that we're all sinners, it's kind of like taking that gift of God and saying thank you and putting it on a shelf in the attic and just letting it sit there and just collect dust. Okay. And God's like, you know, aren't you a saint? Didn't I give you that? You know, uh... So we need to hold fast to what the Bible says about who we are in Christ, our Christian identity as saints, as the beloved of God, as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I just want to end with a couple of verses, uh, kind of prayer or, or thoughts. Um... Let's look Ephesians 1.18. Ephesians 1.18 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And I want to look at Philippians 4.8. Philippians 4.8 says... Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's think on those things, brothers. Let's think about who we are now. Let's think about, you know, what the Bible says about who we are in Christ. Let's not think about the sin that we committed recently. You know, confess it, repent of it. Let's not think about the sins of our past before we were saved and focus on those and be grieved for days on end. So, uh, I hope that I've fully convinced you that we are saints who are saved in Christ Jesus. We are not sinners. We shouldn't say things like we are all sinners. And I may have said that in the past. It's something that i got to work on myself. So I really needed to do this study, and you know, this is a personal thing for me. I've been curious about this. I don't want to. I know the Bible doesn't teach sinless perfection. That's not what I'm teaching. I'm just teaching that we are saints, and um, you know, it confuses things. It's, it's it's wrong to say that we are sinners or that we are all sinners, and we need to refrain from that. So I uh, hope this will help you in your growth with the Lord and your evangelizing, and uh, you know. So, thanks for watching. God bless. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.